Oh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Brent. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter and flying solo, but just for the beginning part of the episode, mixing it up a little bit. We're going to try to do a little three way chat with one of our favorite guests of the year, Brett Sianka, pick six previews here to break down his latest preview magazine. Got the SEC predictions ready to go. First time ever. Brett's done a hard copy of his magazine, which we have in hand. We're going to be breaking it down team by team with old Brett here in just a minute with Cousin Shane. But, uh, hey, before we get to that, a couple news and notes around the SEC. And, hey, our buddy old Vince Morrow giving me a shout-out here. Let's uh, kick it all down to Lexington to start things off where – Never been a guest on uh, Kentucky Sports Radio. I've been on, um, you know, the 11 personnel, Nick Roush and Adam Luckett show, but never on the Kentucky Sports Radio show and still technically have it been. But thanks to old Vince on Kentucky Sports Radio here on Wednesday, giving us a shout out. He is still upset over SEC Media Day. So let's kick it over. To Vince Morrow over at when uh, he made his appearance on Kentucky Sports Radio. I won't ask for a personal favor for Tony Evans, but if we could backtrack to football one more time, Matt mentioned the polls. This is such an under uh, underdog program, always punching up. You love to clap back on Twitter, you know, always bulletin board in the locker room. But are you a little worried being higher second that maybe how the team will react because you're so used to being overlooked and that's been your motivating factor? Yeah, I just think the one that, that gets me going, and he, I, I, I just love the media. Not the media here, but the media south. They just keep, they just got to keep picking this one team. I ain't going to say their name, but they, we, I mean, dude, we, every year it gets us going when we see that. Uh, I think we are worn to what, where we're at right now. We do have a good team. This is our 10th year. Uh, this SEC Mike guy kind of pissed me off because he said, <laughs> that guy, earlier he had us going, he, we, we were the third best team overall in the SEC. And then he get to the media day, and we like fifth in the East. I mean, what the hell happened? Like, he had a big change of heart. You're not well, wrong. We ain't playing no games. We lose nobody. We, I mean, what? So, so, my so man, down SEC with Mike. SEC Mike, dude. I was I was digging SEC Mike because that's a nice name, but I, I got to meet that dude. <laughs> SEC gotta, Mike, that is a yeah, nice. It, it was a nice name, SEC Mike. But, but I, I will say that <laughs> once again, I hey Kentucky fans, they have dug through the the tweets and the mentions and all this. They're still living down there in, in my mentions on Twitter. But confusion, hell, we said it on the show. Go back and watch the media day's breakdown. But power rankings are not a prediction, certainly not in spring. There's nobody covering SEC like we are. We're, we're five days a week here, even in the off season, when we got stuff to talk about here. But things change. How I had Kentucky in the spring does not mean that's how I got Kentucky in the fall. And also, you know, I say this every fall, longtime listeners know, probably tired of hearing it, power rankings, neutral field, team A, team B, who's going to win that football game? That's what the power rankings are measured on. And last time I checked, Kentucky has to go to Florida, to Tennessee. So there's a little mix up there in the power rankings. They do host Georgia, but again, you have a couple of losses mount. You go to Ole Miss. Very tricky football game. And, hell, Mississippi State beat you last year. South Carolina's improved. I mean, there are hiccups in this damn schedule, which I feel like I'm going to have to discuss this until we actually see football. I'm tired of talking about it. I want to see actual football hit the field. But, again, if you missed out uh, the, the Media Days breakdown, full hour-long episode, go back and check that out with Cousin Shane. But, I do appreciate Vince giving me a little shout-out, a little love. And I think uh, just based on that interaction there, you see it's just all in good fun. But, hey, if the Wildcats march their way down to Atlanta for the first time, you can thank me for providing that little extra motivation as training camp began here in Lexington on Wednesday. Now, next on the docket, we kick it on down to Fayetteville where the Razorbacks are geared up for training camp High expectations, obviously, on this show for what Sam Pittman and company can do. I've got them as uh, the number two team in the rugged SEC West, the toughest division in college football, no doubt in my mind. But uh, Sam Pittman, very fired up about the team he's got. 
Pretty interesting comments here as he opened camp on Wednesday. First time. Well, he didn't say first time, but he basically said, hey, we're bigger, we're stronger, we're faster. This looks like an SEC team. I thought that was pretty revealing, not to say that uh, they didn't before, but hell, you know, the COVID year, right out the gate, a couple losses, but the, hell, you, you faced Georgia in the opener. And then last season, of course, you started hot overall, but a little slow against Rice. It was a little concerning. I was freaking out there in the first half. They really got that ball rolling when Texas came to town. They beat the hell out of them. Uh, maybe a different story, and it probably should be because we should be better with the experience and the talent we got on this roster. And we got a Cincinnati team. Again, I've said multiple times, you sleep on Cincinnati, they'll come in here and they'll upset you in Fayetteville. So let's kick it over to Sam Pittman talking about uh, the improvements to this football team. He hits on Dominique Johnson. His status sounds like the outstanding running back may be out uh, to start the season, but he will be there for the majority of the year. He has, I believe, a, a knee injury. He's working back, had surgery in the offseason. But uh, Sam Pittman made it very clear. Rocket Sanders is our man, go-to number one running back. He also said good things about A.J. Green, though, so it's, it is going to be a committee approach. I know someone that uh, Arkansas fans have been dying to get an update on, Tykees Crawford. What's his status? Former touted recruit. You know, is it his time? Arkansas has got four or five returning on the offensive line. They're looking for a fifth starter. Could that be Tykees Crawford? Sam Pittman's going to start him out on the right side of the line. Maybe he can work his way into being their starting right tackle this fall. And Matt Landers is a receiver that uh, Georgia, again, when he came to Arkansas, that's what I said, they talked him up every offseason. And now it never really translated. He had a big year at Toledo. Now he's in here in Fayetteville. We need help at the receiver position. Sam Pittman, it sounds like they're going to get something out of Matt Landers, which is music to Razorback fans' ears. Uh, what's the latest on Dominique? Nate, when do you expect him back? And, B, do you recruit to that? Like, hey, we're going to have a running back by committee thing, and uh, you're not going to have as much wear and tear on your body. Yeah, I think any time that you have the situation that we have, where we're playing several, you have to find in recruiting the positive about that. And certainly ours is, is that, you know, if you're good enough and, and to help us win and, and get drafted and things of that nature, that the wear and tear on your body wouldn't be quite as significant if you're carrying the ball 25 times a game. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, to answer that, you asked me something else. Too. Dominique, you know, we had to talk about that this morning in our staff meeting with Dave. Um, I feel like he'll be able to do some things. Um Maybe not the first week uh, as far as team-oriented type things, but uh, he's progressing well. He's ahead of schedule. And uh, so I don't know if we'll have him for the Cincinnati game or not, but I feel like we're going to have him uh, majority of the season. Sam, I think you said in Atlanta that Tykes Crawford had really – you know, performed well and deserved a chance to go on the field. Well, where do you see him starting off in camp? And, you know, who, where, where would he be competing? You know, he, uh, Ty Keese is going to start off at tackle. I think uh, Cody and I had a long conversation about him. And uh, Dalton is a guy that's, that's – we want him to stay healthy every game, but I, I don't know that he can play every single rep of every game. You know, I don't know – He's got some issues, you know, some physical issues, um, injury wise, and so we're going we're going to solidify that right tackle spot first. We're also going to move him in at right guard. Uh, I just think the guy's a really good player, and I think he needs to help us. And so we're going to keep him on the right side right now, uh, right tackle, right guard. See if he can't win one of those spots. If he doesn't, uh, he's going to play a lot of ball for us either way. We, talk, we talked about left tackle as well. Um, but I think the best thing for him for playing time is to keep him on that right side and let him – right side and let him learn two positions. Like yeah, Matt, Matt is a guy, you know, I knew from Georgia um, when I was there. Uh, certainly looks different than what he did when I when he was a freshman. <laughs> you know, Jordy's big, physical. He can run now. I mean, he can fly. And uh, I think what he's done is he's you know he's he's made us better. You know, he's made Warren Thompson better. You know, he's made Keetron Jackson better. And that's just because of the heat that his presence puts them puts on him. And uh, 
so I think on the outside we're going to be in pretty good shape. I really do, and and uh, but I think he's going to help us, and I think he'll help us a lot. Question about your speed and your strength because you talk about how that's what you got to improve on. Mm -hmm. Did you see some numbers through the summer that you say, okay, we might be faster and we might be bigger and stronger? Yeah, uh, we are bigger. I mean, we're we're a big football team now. We look like an SEC football team in my opinion now. Uh, speed wise, uh, I think uh, there's two far, two two parts of that. One is uh, you recruit speed and the other is you develop speed, you know, so I think we've get, done a really good job, uh, Coach Walker and his staff of developing our guys, uh, obviously to get bigger and stronger, but also we, we spend a lot of time on speed development training as well. So uh, I think we're a, we're a bigger and a faster team. And then I think recruiting and the guys we brought in, we're starting to recruit bigger and stronger and faster guys when they walk in the door and then you can develop them even further uh, at that point. So, yeah, I, I like the way our team looks and I like our team speed. And we had one other press conference here on Wednesday, Jimbo Fisher and them fighting Texas A&M Aggies starting camp down in College Station. So much promise, so much talent, loaded with experience, loaded with incredible, incredible freshman class coming in here. Jimbo Fisher, of course, uh, the question on everybody's mind, the quarterbacks, what goes into that? Who's going to win this starting job? He's going to get asked this basically every press conference, update on the quarterbacks, all this, until he makes a decision. If, if I recall last year, he didn't even make it in one of these. He, he did it on some radio show, I think, down in Houston or something. So who knows how uh, Jimbo Fisher is going to announce this thing between Haynes King and Max Johnson and the freshman Connor Wigman could be anyone's job, but uh, here's Jimbo on, on what goes into that. And I love the fact that, uh, you know, he's very open to playing freshmen, not only playing them, but starting them. And that is what, you know, these coaches, they use these media availabilities to get messages to their team. That's something we talked about with Billy Napier yesterday. And that's what Jimbo should be doing when he's bringing in 25 star <laughs> linemen out here. He's got to let them know, you earn it on the field, on the practice field, you're going to start in the ball game. That's the mentality that all the elite college programs have, and it's the same one Jimbo Fisher's had for years and years, and it's a big reason why competition is going to be huge down there. No one's job is safe in College Station. When you have guys competing um, uh, beyond just general competition and practice, uh, specifically for those guys where starting jobs are on the line and places on depth charts. They're all you, on the line. <laughs> <laughs> would you prefer that they well, – In terms of the guys who are competing for a starting quarterback job, do you have specific areas that you want each of them maybe differently to prioritize and what they show or is it kind of the baseline of are you accurate, can you eat touchdown drives? No, I want, I want that. whoever that quarterback is, he's going to have certain characteristics. Just like, all right, who's going who's to win the national championship? You don't know, but I tell you this: you know what they're going to look like. You know what they're going to do on the field. They're going to be physical at the line of scrimmage. They're going to create big plays. They're going to they're going to be able to not have self inflicted wounds and be very disciplined. Not have penalty. I mean, all those things you do. Same way with the quarterback. I mean, whoever wins that job, he has his characteristics that you have to play. He's got to be make great decision making and accuracy. And maybe we feature throwing a go ball to a post ball. You figure a, a dig to a hook. I mean, each guy has a different thing, but his decision and accuracy and talents and, and things like that, they have to. You know, and be able to collectively unite people for a common goal and make guys understand that and affect guys in a positive way by how they practice or what they say or their demeanor. I mean, there's those characteristics, whoever that guy is, are going to have the same characteristics. They're not going to, they're not going to differentiate. In your history here, and I assume at Florida State as well, mm -hmm. uh, you've shown us that you uh, never hesitate to uh, start a, a true freshman. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you look for to, that makes you – think that those guys are ready to or know that those guys are ready to play and he gives our team the best chance to win but, but there's it, nobody else in that in that regard that gives our team a better chance to win listen i owe that to the other players i owe it to the coaches at work here i owe it to the people in the building as a head coach you're making decisions you owe it to put the guys in position because those guys their jobs their lives and and all what they do is based on that and that's my responsibility no matter what your age is that you know you you owe that responsibility to your team to your coaches to everybody that's employed under you and what you do, that you put the best players on the field to give your team the most chance to be successful. And how do you know that uh, – how do you sense that that guy's ready? Well, about 35 years of coaching okay. and watching the other guy that he's going against or his, or, or his – who the other player is that's competing for that position or what it does for our team and how, our, how we think our team has to win. 
and do we need this or that? I mean, that's how every position guy. I'm not being. I mean, that's how every position has determined who they win and what goes on. And uh, how now, last little update here, real quick on Tennessee. Just wanted to make this note, but uh, after we talked about Laneith Whitehead, the running back being lost for the season due to injury, uh, they have picked up Lin J. Dixon, formerly of uh, Clemson, and I, he transferred to West Virginia for a hot minute. Never played for West Virginia. Uh, he posted on social media here on, on Wednesday that he is officially a Vol, committed to the Vols. Got to get him up and, and ready to go in, in fall camp. And I'm a little mixed on this one. I don't know what Lynn J. Dixon actually brings to the football team. But, again, a former touted guy. He was actually committed to Tennessee at one point. He had over 1,400 rushing yards, 13 touchdowns at Clemson. His career averaged 6.5 yards per carry, which sounds great. But he had 8.8 yards per carry as a freshman, 6.1 as a sophomore. And then the last two seasons, 4.8 yards and 4.8, 4.5 and 4.8. So significant downturn the last two years. And I said he scored 13 touchdowns. He only scored two the last two seasons. So I think if any Tennessee fan is hoping that you're getting some star in Lynn J. Dixon, I mean, this to me seems like an emergency option. And if you're leaning on Lynn J. Dixon, into conference play, that could be a real issue. But Tennessee had to add somebody because they're down to four scholarship running backs right now, and two of them are true freshmen. So, you get, like I said, you got to add somebody. But I'm kind of pumping the brakes on how big of an addition this could be for Josh Heupel's offense here. But all right, hey, held off long enough. Let's kick it over to our interview. Brett Sianka, pick six previews. Cousin Shane, the one guest he's allowed to interview per year. Let's kick it over to our interview. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? <laughs> hey, baby, what's going on? And we also got Brett Sianca pick six previews on the line. Heck yeah, hey, guys, brother. yeah, thanks for having me on. <laughs> hey, Brett, thanks so much. Uh, we were joking just a moment ago. This is the only interview that we allow Cousin Shane to do every year. <laughs> but that, that's because you're that big of a deal. So uh, we had to have you on to talk about your latest Pick 6 Previews magazine. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, I, I look forward every year to hearing that Cousin Shane beer uh, opening uh, <laughs> on, on live air. It's, it's uh, a trademark move. I love it. Um, and the Hey Buddy, of course. So, yeah, but in all seriousness, congrats on, on, to you guys on your success and your growth. I mean, I've been following and listening to you guys for years. And, uh, and seeing you guys um, at SEC Media Days and seeing Mike on uh, Feinbaum and on the live studio show, really cool stuff. Um, and I think I'm, I'm glad the word is getting out because I've been following you guys and listening for years. It's the best breakdowns team by team out there in the conference. So uh, congrats on your end. And, yeah, I'm excited to be on. It's one of my favorite preseason radio st- uh, and podcast stops. So I can't wait to break it down. I like it because it seems like we've been growing together. You know, uh, first interview I think we had was, what, four years ago, something like that. You know, probably had about 50 listeners at the time. And it's just, (laughs) it's fun watching our show grow, your your show grow, your your magazine grow. Uh, It's it's been a part of of our podcast since the beginning. So I'm just excited to have you back on. Oh, yeah, no, that's great praise. Thank you. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, because both of us kind of started independently. You know, we're not with the big companies or anything. It was just a passion for our historic college football sport, uh, the traditions of it, the fans, and engaging with fans. And um, and it's no better place to be than down south where it matters so much more. I'm not saying that facetiously. It really does. I mean, the best recruits, the best high school players are down there, the best fan support, the best boosters, and uh, the best mm-hmm. stadiums, and then uh, eventually the best NFLers. So uh, don't it all you, makes sense. Don't you and, uh, start pandering already, okay? <laughs> 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 Got to get on the good side right away. Well, speaking of growing, uh, Brett, pick six previews. I'm holding it for the camera here. First time ever we've got a hard copy of the magazine. Before we break down some of the information in the magazine, can you tell us uh, – you know, what was the thought process with uh, going with the hard copy this year, which which I love, and it's, it'll be on my shelf for, uh, you know, the rest rest of time here. Yeah, well, thank you for the purchase and the praise there. That's uh, it's great to see. And, um, yeah, it's it's my 11th year doing Pick 6 previews. The first 10 were all online only. It was PDF or online articles uh, for the season preview. But in, here in year 11, I wanted to give it a shot. I mean, I'd been getting requests for years. When do you go into a hard copy and – and I agree. I'm, I'm old fashioned too in that sense. I think it's uh, you want to have the book in your hands. You want to walk with it on the beach, uh, read on the beach, uh, read, you know, on your coffee table on Saturday mornings before the games kick off, and 
I think just to have that tangible product is, is still uh, uh, is still important. So, yeah, I made the decision to go with the print option this year. And, um, you know, we still have the digital available. And when you do buy the print, you get the digital sent immediately. So uh, for those three or four days you're waiting for the shipping to come in, you, you have access right away. So, but no, I think it's, um, you know, it's a historic product, the, the preseason preview book. It goes back for decades, all the way back to the 50s. Um, so I think it is important to have a tangible option. And uh, so far, the reception's been great. I think it's, it's been pretty surreal to see it come to life um, because it's one thing to tell people about a PDF or, or uh, an online article or something, but uh, to have an actual tangible product, I think, has been pretty surreal. And, and where's the best place for the audience, Brett, to go out there? We'll have a link in the show notes, but where's the best place uh, for them to go out and get it themselves online? Yeah, thanks. It's pick6previews.com, um, pick Six previews on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, it's a one-man show. It's all 66 Power 5 teams. I'm breaking it down, talking to head coaches, talking to coordinators and beat writers, and tuning into local radio and podcast, watching spring games the whole bit and breaking it down. So, um, And on that website, pick 6 com, I have a couple sample teams so you can see what we're talking about and some testimonials too, uh, the, the college game day guys, the ACC network guys, um, some, some great names in there too. So, um, yeah, pick 6 com is the only place to find it. Yeah, and I was overwhelmed uh, by the, the production quality of it, Brett. I, you just never know when you get that first copy. I knew that if Pick 6 Previews was putting a magazine out, it was going to be first class, but it's even better than expected. 161 pages, full-color layout. You did an outstanding job. Cannot recommend this product enough. Go out there. You fired up for college football. You, you can't get ready for football without Pick 6 Previews. So, uh, outstanding job, Brett. You really knocked it out of the park here. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, that's, that's great feedback. And, um, and yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to break this down. It's the best conference and uh, got plenty of playoff contenders, a lot of drama, it seems like, across the SEC this year. So uh, I had a fun time breaking that down and um, excited to go through it here. Yeah, and, of course, a lot of uncertainty with the SEC. So we'll get into these picks in just a moment. But one thing I know you're going to mention time and time again, I'd like you to explain it for the audience in case they're unfamiliar with, with pick six previews. But can you get some information on, on your game grader system and, and what all goes into that? Yeah, so game grader was a way for me to, to get a score on each game. Um, you know, on, on fall Saturdays, like I said, it's a one-man show, but but I do have four TVs lined up for 14 hours. I'm trying to capture everything live. Uh, and then on Sunday, I'm watching replays of, of games I missed. But even with that, uh, it, it's hard to really get the true feel of a game uh, all, all crammed in during the season. So what Game Grader is, it goes deeper than just the score that you see on the ticker. I mean, you'd be watching and see, oh, Arkansas won 28-3. to Well, we don't really know what happened in that game. We don't know the yardage differential, the per-play numbers, the explosive plays. Um, so basically, it's all my analytics boiled down into one number on a game. And um, at the end of the day, it's, it's opponent adjusted to because beating Vandy 55 nothing is different than beating Alabama 55 nothing. So uh, long story short, it's a numerical grade on each game um, to show really the statistical dominance of that game. So it goes deeper than the score, um, factors everything in. So it's a way to get a number on these teams. I use it a lot. It can really show you from the prior season which teams were better than the record showed or which ones had some fluky wins and misleading records. So uh, it's a really great predictive tool for me heading into the next season, and I'll probably be referencing it a couple times throughout the show. And speaking of Alabama, no surprise, very original, Brett. You got number one Alabama in the SEC West. Uh, I mean, is it just going to be a revenge tour like a lot of people think, or or do you think A&M, which you got number two, I mean, is there any chance you see Alabama not winning the West this year? Well, there's a lot of firepower at A&M, um, so I won't say there's no chance. But uh, I think coming into the season, Alabama should be the prohibitive favorite to win the West and the favorite to win not only the SEC, but probably the favorite to win it all uh, when you look at this roster. I mean, usually we talk about Alabama sending 10 to 15 players to the pros in April and how, oh, how are they going to reload? This time around, everyone's back. I mean, they, only, they I say only in quotes. They only lost seven draft picks. They bring back the Heisman winner, Bryce Young. They bring back the best defender in the country, Will Anderson. And they, they're surrounded by five stars at every position group. So uh, this Alabama machine, it's going to roll on. Uh, I don't see any reason for it to, to d get derailed here. Um, and then, uh, you know, one last point I want to get in there. Nick Saban, uh, of course, he's harnessed the recruiting game. That's what really put Alabama on the map, uh, stacking number one recruiting classes. But 
really what he's done since then is he's, he's really taken advantage of every new element of the game. When offenses started modernizing, he brought in Lane Kiffin and transformed the offense overnight. Uh, when the NCAA lifted the limits on support staff, he built an army of uh, football resources. And then more, most recently, this transfer portal, he, uh, he really took advantage of it. He's adding all Americans and all conference players to positions of need. So uh, really harnessing the modern tools of the game and keeps evolving. And that's why Alabama is just immovable at the top. They, now, they may not even have something you'd consider a weakness, but what, maybe what is the biggest question you got for the Crimson Tide? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I think uh, maybe a receiver. I mean, you, you lose some firepower there uh, with Williams and Mechie both gone. But, again, speaking to the portal, they patched it up, bringing in Jermaine Burton from Georgia, one of their top receivers, and uh, Tyler Har- uh, Harrell from Louisville, who's a speed demon, a track star. Uh, so he brings your deep threat. Um, and then you could have said maybe a running back. But, guys, this is an embarrassment of riches. I mean, yeah, you lose a starting running back, Brian Robinson, but you have multiple five stars waiting in the wings, and you bring in an All-American candidate, Jameer Gibbs from Georgia Tech. So, I mean, it's really hard to find weaknesses here. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, it, it, I guess the weakness, the toughest part, is that they're going to get everyone's best game. I mean, they're circled on everyone's calendar. Um, but I saw that 10-and-a-half win number. That looks ridiculously low to me. So you're telling me to, to lose on a 10-and-a-half bet, they got to lose twice in a 12-game season. I don't see it. I mean, maybe they get tripped up once, but I don't see two losses from this team. I want to ask on that Gibbs – Gibbs topic there. Um, I was looking at your running back rankings. You've got, you know, your top four, uh, if you will, all Americans. And, and in those top, top four classes, there's two running backs. The only SEC running back you have on there is Gibbs. So I'm just curious, like, what, what are we going to expect? Because I didn't watch a lot of Georgia tech film last year. So, I mean, is he, are we talking, the next Derrick Henry type running back, potential Heisman candidate here? Well, yes and no. I think Heisman candidate, yes, but I don't think that he's the same build and physicality of Derrick Henry. Uh, with, with Jameer Gibbs, what you're getting is lightning in a bottle. He's more of a speedster, a highlight reel kind of guy. And uh, what I saw from him at Georgia Tech was, uh, you know, with a team, you know, one, one of the worst power five teams in America, honestly, not much offensive line and not many outside threats. Teams were keyed in on him. He still broke off. I think it was seven straight games with 50-plus yard plays. I mean, very explosive uh, with nothing around him. Now you insert him into a a perfect roster with a perfect coaching staff um, and so many other weapons that defenses have to allocate resources to. I think he's going to have a lot of breakout moments. And, um, yeah, he won't shoulder the the 300 carries that Derrick Henry did in his his Heisman year. Mm -hmm. Uh, He'll he'll get more receptions, and he'll get more explosive long yardage plays. So uh, if you're looking for a highlight guy, that's your guy. Yeah, maybe I didn't mean to compare the physicality of the two, but just <laughs> yeah, sure, just sure. a household name of, of the oh, running yeah. back. You, usually it's a committee that we hear from teams like Alabama and Georgia. It's just, you know, I, I've, I've seen his name all over the place here in the offseason. It just feels like, you know, maybe maybe we're sleeping on him because, because we've got a lot of gamblers online. I ain't going to lie. You know, this is a gambling <laughs> show too, you know, and, and the fact you've got it so high – intrigues me in the fact that maybe I should potentially look at him as a Heisman candidate. Yeah, well, I think when you talk Heisman, um, there's been one truth since the 1970s, and that's no repeat winners. And I, I don't know if that's by design or, or maybe the majority of Heisman voters are, you know, are, are resistant to giving a guy a, a second award. So mm-hmm. um, if you go off of that, I don't see Bryce Young with a path to the Heisman, even if he matches his 2021 season statistically. We saw Tim Tebow do that in his second year. Um, so if you're throwing Bryce Young out and if Alabama makes a playoff run, somebody on this team is going to get Heisman consideration. And, um, of course, Will Anderson will garner a lot of that. Uh, we'll see if he can stack another great stat season like last year. Um, but if not that, then, yeah, Jameer Gibbs could be your guy. Now, number two in the West, you got Texas A&M where, I don't know if you've seen it, Brett, but Cousin Shane, <laughs> he was dead sober when he made this. He's picking A&M to win not only the West but the SEC. They certainly have the potential – what do you like about uh, the Aggies? Well, I, I like the boldness, and it's really not that bold when you break it down because, um, you know, a lot of the, the people nationally will just focus on last year's recruiting class, and, of course, that was historic. 
But you got to put it into context. Jimbo has started to stack top five classes. I mean, this is just another uh, crown jewel to this uh, recruiting program. I mean, number four, then number six, then number seven, and now number one. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of talent uh, stocked here. And uh, it starts in the trenches. Again, the Maroon Goons, they, they reloaded. Um, that was going to be a question mark for last year, but they really rounded into form. Four starters back up front. Um, so a lot of strength there. They're going to establish their run. Uh, and then, um, you know, on defense, they do lose some key players along the defensive line, but you add in not just one, but four five-star D linemen. I mean, this is like NCAA video game <laughs> stuff right here, uh, just the amount of sheer firepower. I guess the question really is this, is how quickly will these five stars and these 18 top 100 prospects, how quickly will they really get into the lineup and perform at all conference levels? I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's more like 2023. Um, I actually put it in, in the book there. They're, Texas A&M is my early pick for the playoffs, dot, 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 in 2023. I, I think they're still a year away. But, um, but hey, you know, the, the optimist angle, if they improve overnight and they're ready to play all these top 100 guys, yeah, they could contend right away. I have them number five in the country. Who do you think they should start at quarterback? Yeah, so this that's a huge uh, – that one's wide open. And kind of a theme throughout the SEC, there's a lot of these three-man quarterback battles, not even just two guys, but three legit contenders. Um, yeah, with A&M, of course, Calzada transfers out to Auburn. That was your starter last year. The initial starter, Haynes King, he was knocked out early. He comes back, uh, and he's one of the leaders here. You also have Max Johnson coming in from LSU, who ironically led that game-winning drive to beat A&M. So those are your two more experienced guys, but really the wild card, who I'm hearing has the highest ceiling, is this five-star coming in, Connor Wegman, uh, drawing uh, Johnny Manziel reviews and, and comparisons. So that's huge Uh-oh. praise and uh, really a wild card into the mix. And this won't be decided until uh, until fall camp, and I know Jimbo will keep it close to the vest, but um, my hunch is that they'll go Max Johnson, given his experience and at the SEC level, um, but be open to, to rotating guys in and maybe seeing Wegman take over. I want to ask you about Devon Achain and why do you hate him so much? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that at all. I, I think he's a he's a special player. I mean, he posted a high seven yards per carry. He's got home run acceleration, track sprinter. Um, I guess by hating him, I guess that means I put him behind uh, Jameer Gibbs there, but uh, and Tank Bigsby. But hey, it's a crowded conference of running backs. When you go through and try and limit it to, to just two guys on the first team for running back, it's tough. Uh, he's certainly in the discussion, along with Chris Rodriguez from Kentucky, assuming he gets full eligibility this year. But, no, it's it's a really talented roster at A&M. There aren't many weaknesses. I guess the only weakness is just youth. Now you got Arkansas number three in the West. And, and just imagine, Brett, where they were two years ago. I mean, it was not only number seven in the West, but number 14 in the SEC. <laughs> now the Razorbacks are holding their own. What do you like about uh, Sam Pittman's latest group? Yeah, you're right. I was actually down in Fayetteville in 2019. It was uh, it was their fall week, and they were playing Auburn. Uh, camp, you know, the campus was kind of dead, and the stadium was half empty, and, and Auburn put up 55 points on them. And but it, but still, I remember thinking, you know, these are these are great fans. They deserve better than this, and um, couldn't wait for Arkansas to finally bounce back. And it, it happened a lot quicker than I thought it would uh, under Sam Pittman. I think the key with him was uh, obviously his persona, but really his coordinator hires. He he went out and hired a former head coach and Barry Odom to do the defense, and then Kendall Bryles to do the offense. And uh, not only that, but he's kept them there. That's it's key. And, uh, you know, of course, we knew his offensive line would be strong, and that's gotten there again. One of the best in the country, bringing four starters back. And K.J. Jefferson, a great leader. So um, really a strong team. I have them 12th in the nation. It's kind of hard to believe, just given how, how down they were a couple of years ago. But a quick bounce back. And really you saw it come into shape against Texas where it shifted from rebuilding job to really a destination. I mean, the electricity in that stadium um, and the way they were running all over Texas, it made it a a destination for recruits, and you're seeing that come true. Yeah, and I've even been told, Brett, that uh, Texas, Steve Sarkeesian, he basically, you know, they they thought they were going to win that Arkansas game, but after playing them, he said, my God, we're not even ready for the SEC but, but that's kind of what Arkansas is about. That physicality is going to be, beat finesse every single time. And I think that gives them potentially an edge over a lot of – like like an A&M with all this youth, with a lot of these other uh, SEC opponents they have where they're just not ready for that to be leaned on for four quarters like, the, like Arkansas is going to plan to do this year. 
Yeah, well, that's the goal. Um, you know, they want to establish the run. They did that last year by leading the conference and rushing. I think they'll do it again, too. Like I said, given the offensive line coming back, they can go five deep at running back, led by Rocket Sanders. The question for Arkansas, whether they can make the leap into a real conference title contender right away, is the defense. And uh, it, was, it was average to above average last year, um, but they do get two All-American candidates back. Jalen Catalan missed a lot of time last year. He's coming back at safety. And uh, Bumper Pool. I mean, technically he was a backup because they run that 3-2-6 dime package. So only two backers were out there. It was Hayden Henry and Grant Morgan. But Bumper Pool back, uh, one of the best linebackers in the country. So there's star power and there's experience. And uh, overall, as a team, I think they're gonna they're gonna crush that seven and a half win total. That's laughable at this point. I think they're gonna surpass that. Mm. Come on now, <laughs> <laughs> Not... let me lo- let me log on. <laughs> yes, sir, as he says. As I got, says. I got my computer guy on. <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you, Brett. I I don't know how you have uh, you know the confidence to put Ole Miss anywhere. I mean, I think they could be great. I think they could struggle. You've got the Rebels, number four in the SEC West. We know Lane Kiffin, the portal king. What went into uh, Ole Miss being number four in the West? Well, you just hit on it, yeah. I mean, the way that he self-dubbed himself the portal king and then went out and backed it up. That, that was the key by backing it up. And, and he brought in the number two transfer class in America. And if you look at the top transfer classes, a lot of them were former Blue Bloods or current Blue Bloods who were going through coaching changes and when a coaching change happens, you get all these extra roster spots, and that means you can bring in more transfers. So uh, for Ole Miss, not meeting any of those criteria, it's pretty impressive that they, they landed top two uh, with that. So uh, I think players want to come play in this, in this offense. It's fun to watch. It's fun to play in. The ball gets spread around to the receivers, and, um, and they were looking for a quarterback. So they bring in Jackson Dart, one of the top-rated transfers. He's coming in from USC. Um, but I, I think that if you just were glancing at that, you'd assume he's the starter. Uh, but this thing's wide open. Um, Altmaier's back, and he was the he's the incumbent. He played a little bit after Corral was injured. That's definitely a, a two-man battle more than the national media wants to let on. So um, I think, but but here's the point: is that they're both capable. So yeah, it's a competition. But I think you're great either way with that. Um, and yeah, so I think they take a slight step back uh, after last year. It was a historic season, but still enough firepower here on offense. And then really the defense that was a question mark. Uh, you know, it was a pretty bad unit in 2020. A question mark last year early on but if you look at their numbers and my stats in October and November they really improved on defense in fact it was the defense that really won them some of those games down the stretch so um, you know it's a complete team and um, in a tough division that's only good for fourth now, when you're when I want to ask when you're looking at the the, the projected rankings here in the West how, how much of this is analytic analytics and is there any part of it that's just like my ah, gut feeling I I think Lane brought Dart in for a reason. I, I've got faith in him. Is there any? Is there any of that? Or are you just strictly when you when you're when you're picking your picks? Do you just go right down based on on I guess your your analytic side? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm I'm a really competitive guy, and uh, there's a website out there that tracks prediction uh, prediction accuracy amongst the preseason magazine Stassen.com, and I took him the five year title last year. Um, but but. But my point being, I'm super competitive. I try and find every angle I can. I'm, I'm watching spring games, reading practice reports, reading game uh, game recaps, you know, talking to coaches and coordinators, and uh, and trying to trace back all these transfers, what their backstories were, where they ranked high in high school, where, what happened at their previous school. Um, long story short, I'm looking at everything I can. Uh, my numbers, the spring game tapes, uh, the X's and O's, the coaching staffs, everything I can get my hands on. So I have a better answer for you on the next team, Mississippi State, because that's one where I really relied on the numbers more. Uh, they were statistically better than the record showed. We'll get to that next. Um, but, yeah, it's really a mix of all those factors. I, I think it's important to weigh everything, because um, I see it on, on both extremes. Some of the analytics guys, they just click uh, you know, they click their Excel button and run their formula, and that's it. Right. There's no context. There's no X's and O's. But, but conversely, some of the other national writers, they might just – get behind some hype or some some great storylines so i think it's important Mm -hmm. to have both and really learn what they're trying to do we usually make our picks after a a, a case of beer so (laughs) it's good to know that uh, you're actually putting in some insight but hey you hit on it here number five mississippi state i think this is shane's favorite team outside of uh his vol so what do you like about mississippi state and it's wild brett that number five in the west but but you still got them in the top 25 in the country that's just how how loaded the west is 
Yeah, I think I found a, a diamond in the rough here with Mississippi State, and uh, I was shocked when I saw the other preseason magazines had him last in the division or sixth in the division. I've got him at fifth and, and almost considered him for fourth with Ole Miss or a tie scenario. I think that they're both kind of right there neck and neck for the fourth spot. Um, and I touched on it just then, but this is a team last year when you see their record, you, you, would think, uh, you wouldn't think much of it, seven and six, and they lost the bowl game. Um, but really, this, this is one of the more misleading records of 2021. Right away, three of their games were just ridiculous special teams blunders. Um, they had they missed three field goals in one game against Arkansas. They lost by three. Uh, missed another field goal and roughed a punter and another three point loss. And uh, and they had that ridiculous punt return touching against Memphis. I mean, these are things that don't tend to reverse or they don't tend to repeat year to year. They tend to reverse or um, you know flip back towards the mean. So a better team than the record showed. Plus, you get all this defense back. Uh, this defense was. I'd say above average or average, but uh, they're top 10 in returning production on defense, which is a clear indicator of year-to-year improvement. I like Zach Arnett's 3-3-5 base, and uh, all this talent is back. So look for the defense to make an improvement. And the offense, uh, when you listen to Mike Leach speak about his team and his offense and his scheme, and uh, I read his book, Swing Your Sword, basically it's all about reps. It's, he has a little play card that has five plays on it, but it's all about repping them a million times. Uh, so that when game you know, when the game comes, it's second nature. And what happened was when he took over in 2020, they didn't have any of that time. It was all canceled in spring. So uh, they kind of missed a year of prep. But now year three, I think Will Rogers will eclipse that 5,000-yard mark and take another step forward. And this team is uh, really uh, being slept on nationally. Mm. What's the over-under? Uh, I, I don't have that pulled up. Do you have that? I don't have that off the top of my head uh, from Mississippi State. I suspect that there's some value there because um, if the other if the other magazines have them dead last in the division, I think that's yeah. way off. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's some value here. Like like Mike said, I have them 22nd nationally. And and uh, and and to get back to Shane's question about the analytics, they were 22nd last season in my uh, in my game grader formula, despite that seven and six record. So that shows you this is a lot a team that was a lot better than that record. And brings back a lot of talent, a lot of returning starters, and uh, returning production. So, uh, look for a uh, look for a win column jump here. It, now, Mike Leach always seems to upset somebody too, though. I mean, last year was at A and M. If there's, you know, I know they they also got to play Georgia, which is tough. But we already hit on the teams you got ahead of them in the West. If there was one team you think Mississippi State catches this year out of out of just the the teams we've already mentioned and Georgia, you could you could throw them into the mix. Uh, which do you think is most likely that the Bulldogs take down this year? Well, I see this back-to-back slate of A&M and Arkansas, both in Starkville. Um, I think I would say they're more more likely to upset Arkansas. Um, when we when we went through the Arkansas preview, there was one question being their their pass defense, and um, you know that you know, I think Mississippi will be able to move the ball and, and throw all over them. And and they should have had him last year when you watch that game. Like I said, they missed three field goals against Arkansas, ended up losing just by three. So if they hit two out of three normal field goals, they win the game outright last year. So I think they'll have some success throwing the ball on the Arkansas defense, and uh, that's probably their most likely upset bid. And right here I pulled it up, six and a half is the win total for Mississippi State. So, hey, that, that made me want to jump on as well. But, hey, we got to move on. You got LSU number six in the West. What in the heck do you make of this, Steve? Because I got no clue, Brett. Maybe you can clue us in here. Yeah, this is a very variable team, variable outcomes that could happen in 2022. Um, of course, they have all that blue chip talent stockpiled from former top five classes, but then they uh, they were extremely thin at the bowl game with only 37 scholarship players. Um, and then you bring in Brian Kelly in a historic coaching transition, the first uh, first head coach to leave Notre Dame on his own accord for another college job since the World War, you know, since World War II, 1944. So really rare. Um, you know, he had his gaff there at the the LSU basketball game with this fake accent. But I think that LSU fans warmed up a bit when they saw the caliber of player he was bringing in through the transfer portal. Um, they finished number three, I believe, in the transfer class rating. So uh, really starting to accelerate that reload, that rebuild. I still think it's a transition year. And uh, I hate putting anybody down at sixth or seventh in the West, but I think they're poised for a, a transition year. Uh, a lot of youth on the offensive line, that's going to hurt them. I want to ask on the Kelly front, because we've not watched a lot of Notre Dame games down here, but if you were, you know, I guess to compare it to any other coaches in the SEC, what kind of what kind of offense should we expect there in LSU? Is this going to be a fast tempo offense? Is this, you know, is it going to be similar to a, a Lane Kiffin type of style or, 
what what kind of what kind of system do you do you expect to see down there in LSU? Well, I think comparing the different LSU eras, this is probably pre um, pre Joe Burrow LSU offense, where it's still that I formation. It's great offensive line play. It's power run um, and some play action off of it, kind of like a Big Ten West offense. Um, and they've had a lot of success with that at Notre Dame once they got their their offensive line pipeline rolling. Um, I mean, look at they had Ian Book as a four year starter and and won a ton of games with him. So um, and that's not a knock on him. It's just that he wasn't. They weren't throwing the ball fifty times a game. So I think more of a smash mouth, old fashioned style, if you want to put it mm-hmm. that way. Okay. Now you said you hate to put anyone dead last, but seemingly everybody's got this team dead last in the West. Auburn Tigers coming off a, a season where started hot, but then they they dropped, I believe, five in a row to to end the season. W- what about the Auburn Tigers? Yeah, you're right. They they peaked in the, entering November. They're six and two. They lost five straight to end the season, and then the off season started, which was arguably worse than that, uh, with that whole uh, coaching scandal. And and you know you can make of that what you like, but it was a huge distraction enough to have both coordinators leave, and then another twenty players hit the transfer portal. So you're losing a lot of reserves, younger players, you know, former top recruits that would have been growing into starting roles this year. Uh, so their depth is just wrecked, and um, in, in such a tough division where where you can find positives and higher ceilings from the other six, uh, they were my pick for last. And, and yeah, that's usually, um, you know, all these SEC West teams could probably contend in other divisions, but uh, someone's got to be last, and it's, it's certainly Auburn this year. Now, of course, you got Georgia number one in the East. I've, he- I've heard it compared like this, Brett. I mean, they basically got 12 games to figure out how to beat Alabama. Is, is that how you see, <laughs> you see it? They're, they're that far above the rest of the East? Oh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's interesting because with Tennessee's offense, I think that might be a nice test for the new Georgia defense. Now, here's the thing is that they have all the way till November to figure it out, and I'm pretty confident that Georgia will by then. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, this defense last year was record-setting. It was the best defense that I've ever covered doing pick six previews for the last decade, um, and they, they set an NFL record for a number of defenders being drafted in the first three rounds. So uh, a ton of star power is gone, yes, but – uh, if you watch Georgia and you, you check their snap counts and stuff like that, they rotated a lot. Uh, so it's not just the, the, the 11 starters that played every snap. They had guys for specific situations. They had third down sets and everything. Uh, so when you hear, when you see that returning starters number, take it with a grain of salt because um, these guys still got a ton of experience last year, and really they're all five stars anyway. So, yeah, you lose <laughs> some NFLers, but here's your next wave of NFLers. You know, these guys are all going to be picked next April. So. Um, I have a lot of uh, a lot of faith in this staff and uh, just the recruiting pipeline that they've built that they're going to bounce right back and win the East. You mentioned Tennessee. Is there any other teams that you see possibly sneaking up and giving Georgia a ball game? Uh, no, I don't think so. And uh, I know it's a boring answer, but there's just such a divide here. I mean, I have Georgia third in the country, and then after that in the East, you go all the way down to 24th with Tennessee. And um, and yeah, I like. There's a lot to like from Tennessee, their offense, but I don't think that they have the defense to match it quite yet. Uh, mm-hmm. Florida is going through a big, big coaching change with Billy Napier, and I know they have some star power, but just uh, not enough proven there. And then Kentucky is, uh, you know, Kentucky, you can go South Carolina. We're going to hit on these teams too, but uh, I just think that the talent gap is so massive in this division. Um, now, if they had A and M and Arkansas stacked over in this division, maybe, but um, th- you know, the gap between Georgia and Tennessee, I think, is still pretty large. Well, leave it to Cousin Shane to try to jump ahead. But I, I do got a question here about <laughs> Stetson Bennett. Now, now, based on what you said, Brett, I, you know, you got confidence that Georgia's defense will, will round into shape. But what if it doesn't with Dan Lanning off to Oregon? And, and I'm not sitting here saying Georgia will be horrible on defense, but, you know, maybe, maybe if they're just, you know, take a, a slight step back from historic pace, can, is Stetson Bennett good enough to lead Georgia – to an SEC title, to a national title, if he has to lead the way this fall. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I'm a Stetson Bennett believer. I I, I really like this guy, and uh, I like this guy's story, and uh, I hated seeing him be you know, dragged along by the national media all year. Um, when you look back at his stats, it's kind of hard to believe, just given the, the coverage on him. He had the third highest QB rating in all Power 5, and that was that's between Bryce Young, the Heisen winner, and the finalist, C.J. Stroud. So you can say, yeah, he managed the game well, but he did a lot more than that. And um, They actually finished with the number five most explosive passing uh, plays. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is by design. They want to establish that run game, but then hit explosive plays over the top, and, and he, he hit home on more than, more than he missed. 
Um, and then around him, I really this is the key is I really like what they have around him. Um, I know they got to re- replace two All Conference linemen up front, but five star running backs, a deep receiver core, and really the best tight end room in America. Uh, Brock Bowers himself was uh, an All American candidate. Then you have Darnell Washington. Arik Gilbert, a former five-star, and even Oscar Delp coming in. I mean, you could go uh, four deep at tight end that could probably start almost anywhere <laughs> in the country. So, And and, and uh, Todd Munkin likes to utilize them, too. So um, really a lot to like, and I think that the, the offense can carry them early on if that's uh, if that's needed. That's, that's how good I think this offense is. Brad, I want to ask about uh, – you've got a section in your book talks about non-conference games, and the second one on your list there is Oregon versus Georgia – just how big is this game going to be? Are we overlooking it? No, I think it's it's really important uh, in the playoff scheme too, because Oregon is in that in that group out in the Pac-12 that um, they have a shot at winning the conference, but can they win it with only one loss? And this might be the the second loss when you, when we look back on the season. So it's got playoff caliber uh, implications right away. You also have a cool storyline with Dan Lanning, uh, his homecoming. He's playing against Georgia, the defense that he just won a national title with. And, you know, he's a young head coach, a first-time head coach, a young staff around him. But um, And then if you're looking for player personnel matchups, I really like this matchup in the trenches, uh, specifically uh, Oregon's offensive line against this Georgia front seven. Uh, the way that Mario Cristobal built Oregon up, um, their offensive line, and they're all back. I know that he's gone, but the, the linemen are still there, so – uh, mm-hmm. Great battle in the trenches. It's going to be physical, and um, yeah, it, it really set the tone for the for the opening weekend. Now the team cousin Shane's been waiting for them Tennessee balls. <laughs> and you know, Brett, I, going back and looking at last year's, I think I think you may have had Tennessee fifth or sixth in the East, if I'm not mistaken. And and hey, I I can't blame you because hell, they they added this coach that you know, the pieces didn't fit what he wanted to do. They lost 25 guys in the transfer portal. How big of a surprise were the Tennessee Vols to you? And, and do you got it? Obviously you do. You got confidence because you got them number two that you think they'll build upon that and potentially be even better. Yeah. Well, my hat's <laughs> off to Josh Heupel, the way he turned that around overnight. I, I didn't expect to see that quite honestly. Uh, the, the metrics that you just talked about, the 25 transfers, um, plus this, this cloud of uncertainty with the, the investigation going on. Uh, it just didn't seem like a great fit. Um, well, that's, that's the wrong way of putting it. It, it, it was a great fit. Um, I'm just saying it was a tough scenario to walk into, uh, especially when you look at their offensive style under Pruitt. It was more old-fashioned, smash-mouth, uh, 1980s football, and for him to bring in this high-powered UCF attack, uh, I just thought it would take a year or two to really get it going. But Looking back on it, this was one of the best offensive improvements year over year that I've ever covered. I mean, the, the, the numbers back it up. It's right up there with, um, you know, when TCU modernized in 2014 and when Auburn found Nick Marshall lightning in a bottle 2013. Uh, this is right up there. And, um, you know, so and a lot of it's back. Most of that offense is back. Four starting linemen are back. Uh, I think two of their trio at receiver. But really the key, the key is Hendon Hooker um, coming in. He took over midseason, or I guess in September, the second game. He really lit it up. And if you're looking for a dark horse Heisman candidate, uh, based off his stats alone, I think he's going to be in the discussion, especially if they start to stack some of these big wins. So, um, yeah, that's that's the offense. I have a lot of faith there. They're going to put up a lot of points. They're the fastest tempo in America. And um, the, the key, though, for them is can they start to match it with defense? And the defense is below average last year. That needs some work. Um, not just in, in the stats and all that, but even tackling and pursuit, it didn't look great. So I'm looking for a jump there to, to, keep, to make them the second-place team in the East. And how, how big is that Pitt game at Pitt? Because, I, I, you know, I have people on here, some people say Pitt, some people say Tennessee. Uh, I don't know what to make of that game. What can you tell us about that non-conference showdown? It's interesting. Last year when that happened, we didn't think much of it, but it turned out that Tennessee was facing off against a Heisman candidate and, uh, and, a, and a Power 5 conference champion, Pitt. Uh, I don't see them repeating that. I don't see any Heisman candidates over at Pitt this year. Kenny Pickett's gone. Their Blitnikoff winner, Jordan Addison, got plucked away by USC, and, uh, and their offensive coordinator, Mark Whipple, has gone to Nebraska. So uh, an offensive transition there. I know that the line is back, but um, you know the skilled players Just are going wait. through a transition we'll find there. One. <laughs> no, I, I really feel confident there with Tennessee, and um, I know it's at Pittsburgh, but I mean I'm from Pennsylvania. I'll tell you, you're going to see more yellow seats there, and that's not the kids wearing yellow. That's the empty Heinz Field Steelers seats. Um, so that'll be either orange or yellow uh, by empty seats. So I think Tennessee wins that, and um, they're going to put up a lot of points in that game. 
Now, number three, you got a tie here, Brett, in the SEC East Florida, which I think is is a team that many, many people are overlooking heading into the year. And uh, you got Kentucky as well. But let's get into Florida first. Why are you wisely uh, so high on the Gators? Yeah, well, I, I always like to check after my book is released. I go right away to SEC Mike <laughs> Twitter. And I want to see, hopefully, I love when you're in my corner on some of these picks. Like uh, a couple years ago, it was Georgia. And, um, yeah, but anyways, long story short, yeah, I, I'm glad to have you on this camp. A lot of people have Florida fourth uh, or even lower in the division. I was shocked at that. There's just so much roster talent here. People forget that, yeah, they had a bad record last year. But um, I think uh, once that season went downhill, I don't want to say they quit, but they definitely lost focus with the coaching hot seat and all the drama there. So I think uh, a fresh start here, a great coaching staff I know it's their first time in the SEC and first time at the power five level as a head coach Billy Napier but um, it sounds like they're getting it cleaned up and um, you know there's there's enough roster talent I like uh, Anthony Richardson a quarterback he's electric with the ball just hope he can stay healthy because uh, if he gets knocked out you know that, that offense loses some appeal um, but yeah five stars on the defensive line that caught my eye these guys are both back and um, yeah I, I just think that they have just as high a ceiling as Kentucky if not better um, so I was shocked to see that people were putting Kentucky second. Uh, I, you know, we'll get to them next. I have a lot of respect for what Mark Stoops has built, but I think the firepower here at Florida might be just a notch higher. And, and how- like if you were to pick, I, I just want to ask because it's tough. It's tough picking a top. And obviously, you were real close with Kentucky and uh, and the Florida game. You know, I know I know we got a few few more weeks and months away. But if you were right now to say who who you think would win that game. Who do you got as a favorite going into that Florida Kentucky matchup? Well, here's the deal with Florida. It's a really tough draw in September for them under a new coach, a whole new coaching staff. I mean, you open up against one of the most, well, the two most physical teams in the country with Utah right away and then Kentucky. Utah is basically the Kentucky of the Pac 12. They're super physical, great offensive line play, great player development. They both grade high in that. Um, so, what I'm getting at is they're going to come roughed up into the Kentucky game in week two. And, uh, I would take Kentucky to win that game. But the reason I've got it as a tie is uh, is because I think as the season evolves and this team grows under the new coaching staff and, and starts to focus in, I think they're going to catch up in the win column. So I see them both going right in that 5-3 and three or 4-4 four and four range in the within the SEC to have a tie. So let's hit on Kentucky. Like I said, you got them tied for number three in the East. What do you like about uh, uh, Mark Stoops' latest team? Well, Mike, Mike before, before we go to Kentucky, can I ask just one question? Because – I got to ask this Utah. You've got Utah in the top four. Uh, you know, we're going to get to see a preview of that week one with the Florida Gators. Um, what, why, why is Utah getting all this hype? Are they really that good? Are they, I know you're, <laughs> I know you love the mutes, man, but I'm just trying <laughs> to figure out, how, you know, top four in a college football playoffs, a big deal. So wh- what are we going to see week one from these guys? Yeah, well, I think it's important to, to note this, that, you know, I have them in the playoff as the number four team, but I don't think that I'd favor them against other teams in the top, top ten like A&M or Michigan. What, you know, when you do a playoff prediction, you got to see who has the most likely path into the Final Four. Uh, and there's three definitely proven products. I have Ohio State, Bama, Georgia as kind of the three superpower programs. But from there, you gotta find, you got to figure out who's the most likely conference champ from the other three conferences to come out of there undefeated or one loss. Uh, the ACC, I'm, I'm not sold on Clemson. Their, their offense was the worst in the conference, uh, according to my metrics last year. I don't see an overnight fix. The Big 12 is really wide open. I mean, you could talk five teams into winning that conference. Oklahoma in a transition year. Baylor losing all their skill talent on the outside. So uh, mm-hmm. it went, came down to the Pac-12 for me, and I really like what Utah did with, with their quarterback change last year. Uh, their 9-4 and four record, that, that won't really uh, that won't, won't really flash on paper when you look at it, but when you dig in, they were 1-2 and two with the other quarterback, Charlie Brewer. They finally made the quarterback mm-hmm. switch, and uh, they played playoff caliber ball all the way out. That whole offense is back. Uh, great tight end play, Dalton Kincaid and Brent Keithy, uh, Cam Rising back at quarterback, and um, – what else? Morgan Scally has a proven product every year on defense. So all that to say, I'm pretty worried for that pick going into the swamp on the opening <laughs> night of the season. That place is going to be electric. And I know the Gator fans. Yeah, I know the Gator fans are ready to, to wash away that the end of that Mullen era with a fresh start. So um, I just hope by the time they're playing Tom Petty that my playoff record, uh, my playoff prediction <laughs> is already knocked out of this thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> so back to the Utah of the SEC, as, as you're essentially called. Kentucky Wildcats, you got faith that uh, even though we lost three key offensive linemen, uh, running back status kind of up in the air, uh, you think Kentucky is going to be ground and pound and, and, and having success in the SEC once again? Yeah, I really do, and there's some transition there. Uh, of course, you lose Wandell Robinson, who was kind of the do-it-all on the outsides. They're hoping to get lightning in a bottle again, bring in another Robinson, this time for Virginia Tech with Tavion Robinson. Um, certainly some transition there. At coordinator, it's kind of similar, where you lose Liam Cohen, but uh, you're bringing in a guy off the same coaching tree and wants to keep it keep what worked from last, last year going. So I, I hope for some continuity there. Will Levis, a quarterback, I mean, it's been well documented how high some of these draft gurus have him going. Um, I think he's a solid player. I don't know about number one overall in the NFL draft, but um, he can go certainly prove that this year on the field. Um, but then, yeah, really what made it, what's made Kentucky special under, under Stoops has been two things. One, their player development, and this is a metric that I do. It compares the, the raw recruiting rankings that you're seeing on signing day compared to NFL draft picks. You know, are they developing their players on campus for those four years? And they always excel in this metric. In fact, they're all the way up to number five this cycle in, in the nation. So. Mm. They do a great job with that, and the second reason is their offensive line, this big blue wall that they've built and continue to reload. I know they lose three, uh, three big linemen, but when you look now, the way they've been recruiting recently, they have five stars, four stars, top JUCO players. So uh, I think they're going to reload yet again on the offensive line and, and uh, keep this thing rolling. Now, one of the biggest wild cards in the SEC, South Carolina, it's, it's hard to know what to make of them. They, they improved – a, a ton via the transfer portal, yet the schedule is so difficult. A lot of people think could have the same record but be a significantly better team. What's your read on the Gamecocks? Yeah, so this one came down to a battle for fifth place for me between South Carolina and Missouri. I ended up siding with South Carolina, uh, mostly off that transfer portal class. And it, it seems like forever ago, but you think back to, to early December when the transfer portal heated up, they had the first two big wins. They brought in Spencer Rattler, the former Heisman candidate, uh, preseason candidate, that is, from Oklahoma, and his tight end, Austin Stogner. And they rode that momentum to a top-10 transfer class in America, which is very notable there for Shane Beamer in his second season. Uh, what held them back from being ranked higher for me, um, this is a team kind of like Mississippi State where I look to the game grader a little bit, um, and they were really poor last year statistically. Uh, it just doesn't look like a team that would that would be jumping up into SEC the East Division contention, but there are some positions that I do really like. I like their front seven a lot, uh, multiple five stars, some in-state kids there uh, along the defensive line. Um, I like the quarterback. I think that's going to be a major improvement given the uncertainty they had there last year. You'll have some stability with uh, with Rattler and some power five experience. And running back, too, I'll throw in there, too. I really like Marshawn Lloyd. Um, mm -hmm. And even though you lose Kevin Harris, there, there's a lot of great guys there. Uh, Juju McDowell. Um, and uh, Wake Forest transfer Christian Beal Smith too coming in. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely positions on this team that I like a lot. It's just that in such a crowded division, I, I think that the other teams have higher ceilings and are more proven. Now, it seems like you're a little bit down on Clemson, which we appreciate so those comments. What are the odds that South Carolina can make this a little bit more competitive ball game than it than it has been here recently? Well, I'll say it's not going to be thirty nothing again. That, that's for sure. I don't see that repeating. Um, I, kind of the positives I just hit on uh, their defensive line for South Carolina, I think will hold their own against Clemson's O-line, uh, which is a position for Clemson that used to be one of the best in the country. I mean, under those dynasty years, they were consistently the number one rushing per carry team in America. That, that has really fallen off. They struggled to protect DJU last year. So if you're looking for position matchups, I like their D-line against Clemson's O-line. I guess the inverse is true, though, for Clemson's D-line going up against South Carolina's O-line. So um, yeah, but it's going to be closer than 30 nothing. I'll, I'll put that in there here uh, five months away from kickoff. But, um, <laughs> you know, that, that's important for South Carolina to start to chip away at that and, and eventually get a W in that series, similar to how Ohio State and Michigan were starting to go a decade plus without a win for the other side. you got to reignite that rivalry by stealing one um, and getting it back on the even footing. So out of, out of the ones we've gone, because this is, I guess it was hot topic down there immediate days was, Who's going to be second in the SEC East? And it seems like everybody's got a different answer. Uh, your book, you've got Tennessee, which I personally love. Mike had Florida. We, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm even starting to see a few South Carolinas pop up. And I don't know if that's more about hype or, or just, you know, buying into some of the talent Beamer's bringing down there. But out of, out of all these teams, is there one on your list here that you could see 
surprising a few people. Um, you know, is there one that you could see moving up this list quicker than others? Well, I'd probably go Florida. Um, you know, just uh, it, it's hard to throw. Out, I mean, it's hard to throw out the results of 2020, but I almost want to some of this some of this losses down the stretch of Florida had. I mean, I just know that they're better than that, um, and and they have a lot of uh, talent stockpiled there. So if that can click quicker than we think, and right away, mm-hmm. if they start, you know, if they, if they have a great fall camp and really get up to speed, and Billy Napier gets to you know get, gets control of the program like he had at Louisiana Lafayette, then they could really surprise. Um, because yeah, it, it, I mean, when you look at roster talent, recruiting rankings, all that, it, it's definitely there. Um, but but uh, yeah, I don't see it from from Vandy. I guess we'll get to them and Missouri uh, going through another transition year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Kentucky. I mean, it's a great story. I really, like I said, I respect what they've done, especially when you look at the historic context there. Stoops has been incredible for them. But I, I wonder if we've seen their ceiling. Um, now, all that to say, they did just sign a top 15 recruiting class in 2022. That's still a couple of years away from contributing, so maybe they do unlock a higher ceiling down the road, but I, I just don't yeah. see it for this upcoming year. Now, right. You mentioned Missouri being right there, kind of close to South Carolina. What do you like about the Tigers? Who they see, When we have high expectations for them, they, they crater. When, when we say they can't compete, they, they surprise the hell out of us. What do you make out of the latest uh, Missouri Tigers team? Well, the, the thing that caught my eye the most about Missouri in this this might be off topic, but it was the recruiting. Um, you know, when, when uh, Drinkowitz was hired, he made it a point that they were going to rebrand as this new zoo instead of Mizzou, uh, really try and lock down the in-state talent. Um, and that's coinciding with the timing that Missouri as a state, as a high school football state, is surging, uh, producing the most blue-chip talent that they've ever had there. So great timing, and they're executing on it. They brought in a lot of in-state talent, five stars, um, you know, five-star receiver. Burden is going to start right away, and he's going to be a, a number one one wide receiver for them uh questions at quarterback i'm not so sold on uh, what they have there after losing connor basilek um so that's enough to put them all the way down at sixth and uh not just that though not to oversimplify i mean the numbers weren't great last year losing record um they got all ran all over by army in the bowl game and um yeah so i think that this is still a project i like that they stayed with drinkowitz um you know that recruiting class alone placing 15th in the country that's a record for Missouri. That's you know way above their their program average. So I think you, you ride him out a few more years, let this class come to fruition in 23 and 24, and really see what you got. But I think transition year uh, written all over him this year. Now, what do you think about their new defensive coordinator Blake Baker, who I know called plays at Miami. It didn't go that well down there. But uh, any insight into Blake Baker and what he brings to Missouri? Yeah, I actually got to interview Blake Baker a couple cycles ago uh, when he was Miami's defensive coordinator, and and he and Manny Diaz uh, together, they really built their defense around uh, aggressive play calling, you know, attacking, blitzing, and they consistently place place in the top ten of my negative play metric, which traces uh, plays made at or behind the line of scrimmage, you know, sacks, tackles for loss. So very aggressive. You're going to see a lot more blitzing, a lot more disguised blitzes. But with that said, that that does overexpose them to long yardage breakdowns. So it's kind of a you know, a home run or a strikeout kind of deal. So, um, no, I, I actually thought that their defense is graded well when he was there, and I know that Miami got a lot of negative pub um, as being one of those brands that's always, you know, are they back, are they back, that kind of thing. But I thought that he was a pretty good coordinator, and I'm, I'm excited for his uh, next opportunity here. So last we got, of course, the Vanderbilt Commodore, such a, uh, a complete rebuild that Clark Lee inherited. What do you see in the Commodores and, and any signs of – Certainly not sitting here saying they're going to take over the SEC, like you said, at media days, but signs that uh, that things are at least pointed in the right direction. Yeah, there are certainly signs for optimism. Um, you know, Now, with that said, I have them dead last in Power 5, uh, so it won't be this year. But I think building for the future, I, I do like – yeah, I like the hire. You have an alumni there who's clearly passionate about Vanderbilt. He's not viewing this as a stepping stone or just a first-time job. Uh, he's really excited about it. That, that's huge. I know that sounds dumb, but that, that's huge. Um, and I also like that the athletic department finally secured the financial commitment that's been missing for years here. Um, I mean, at one time they didn't even have an athletic director. So uh, just to have the financial uh, commitment, the facilities are upgrading, that also gave them more room for their recruiting staff. And, of course, they brought in Barton Simmons of 247. And um, all that to say, they, they just notched the no, uh, top 40 recruiting class, first time in over a decade. So uh, they're building for the future. It's going to be a long rebuild. I think last year showed us how, just how long a rebuild that's going to be. Um, another transfer portal exodus really hurts. I think it's 25 players out again. So it's going to be a longer rebuild, but I think they have the right guy to 
you know, it, who's in it for the long game. Did it surprise you that, that Coach Lee came out and said Wright was a starting quarterback for Bandy? Well, I, I thought it, I thought that uh, the surprising part was that it was announced already. I, I could have seen either guy winning it. Uh, I think I actually listened on your guy's show when you were interviewing a Vandy expert um, talking about how these two guys – actually, I think it was Mike's spring game review of Vandy, and it was a good point saying how both these quarterbacks, they could be the two best players on the whole team, but it's a shame yeah. that you can only play one of them. Uh, especially with their three-year offensive lineman transferring to Alabama. I think that became even more true. Um, so you can only play one of them, um, and they were both you know, they both were solid last year. So you can't go wrong if you're Vandy. I was just shocked at how early. You know, usually let that play out in fall camp. Right. Now, last thing I got for you, Brett, what's holding Vanderbilt back from becoming, say, the Northwestern of the SEC? Do you think they got the potential to, uh, to, to be that type of program in the SEC? Yeah, well, I think that you need to look at uh, other comps like uh, even Stanford too, with the high academics in that in that uh, in that region of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that when you see from Northwestern, they really committed to the football too. I mean, they gave Coach Fitzgerald, who by the way is an alumni, an alumni linebacker, just like Clark Lee, um, who you know they went they went in for the long, long game. They invested in their facilities. They have the beautiful lakefront property there, that the practice facility, and uh, they hammered in some recruits and transfers. So. Uh, yeah, long story short, they definitely have the same profile in terms of academics. Um, we just got to see the commitment there, and it's, it's definitely starting. So uh, I will say this. It's a lot harder to build a team like that in the SEC East and the SEC than it is the Pac-12 North. I mean, there are no gimmies in this, in this conference, in this division. So it's going to be hard to get back to bowl season, even if you have great improvement. Um, that's, not so, that's not so much the case if you throw Vanderbilt in the Pac-12. Maybe they'd make a bowl, but... Uh, not out here. It's really tough. There's no uh, no easy Saturdays. Well, I can't thank you enough, Brett. We, we've kept you over an hour here, so I really do appreciate <laughs> all your time. Uh, one more time before you jump off, can you tell the audience where to find you and where to find your outstanding Pick 6 Previews Preview Magazine? Yeah, well, thanks a ton for having me. I, I look forward to this one every year on uh, my preseason uh, radio and podcast tour. So it's been great, and best of luck again. This season coming up, it's, it's been great watching you guys grow, and uh, we'll be in touch on Twitter and on the podcast. So, yeah, it's pick6previews.com, at pick6previews on Twitter. Uh, again, it's all, all 66 Power 5 teams. It's a one-man show. It's just me going through all these teams, head coach calls, coordinator calls, everything. Um, on there, there's some testimonials, too, some sample teams, and um, it's pick6previews.com, and I appreciate it. Right, hey, that's going to do it for this episode of the show. Really appreciate Brett for joining the show and breaking down his outstanding preview magazine. You can find a link to get the magazine in the show notes. Cannot recommend this magazine enough. I have the hard copy. Costs a little extra, but I love having that thing in my hands. And I don't know about you guys, but, you know, these Athlons, I used to buy Phil Still. I don't really buy him anymore, but Athlon, Pick 6 Previews, I keep these things. I love to keep them back on the shelves. Beat them back during the, once the season's over and during the summer. Give me some good college football reading material, and now you can do that with the Pick 6 previous. Or, hell, you could just buy the digital version and print it out yourself. I can't thank Brett enough for taking the time to join the show. But that is going to do it. And, hell, we got several more guys. We, I didn't even get to Mark Stoops' comments. We'll get to those on the next episode. Shane Beamer is going to be on the next episode. So uh, lots more coaches coming on the next episode of the show. We're finishing strong. LSU is about to get going here. Uh, we are going to have you covered. We may even have to do a Saturday show. There's so much coming down the pike. But stay tuned for all the SEC football content you can handle. We'll catch you on the next one.